Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video we created a new asset class for textures and defined all the properties that are needed to represent a texture in the game editor. Today we are going to work on the import function of the texture class. We start with the import function. Check if the file exists. Since we are going to do stuff that can throw exceptions, we are going to cache those here. I'd like to make a small change to the asset class such that the abstract functions, like import and load, must return a boolean value indicating success or failure. Also, we are not using the source path anywhere. This was meant to point to the file which was imported. But for geometry assets as well as textures, we are not using it, so I am going to remove it. As I mentioned, load and import functions must return a boolean. And we also remove all references to source path. I'll remove it from asset info class as well. Now, because we changed the data format of the asset files, we are no longer able to read any assets that were already imported in the editor. So we must not forget to delete all assets from the game project before starting the editor. In the geometry class, we see that the source path was being set but it's never used for anything, so we can remove it. Here we need to return a boolean value. Let me reorganize this function a bit. I think it's better to let import fbx function handle any exceptions that might be thrown, so I'll get rid of the try catch block here. Then we'll use the result of import fbx function, which means that it too has to return a boolean. Here we basically just return true if there were no exceptions. I'll also add an empty block to remind myself that we have to import embedded textures if any. But of course we need to finish texture importing first. In the load function, again we return true if there were no exceptions. One thing that I've been meaning to do for quite a while now is to remove the type when the target type is known. For example, here we know that we are creating an LOD group, so there is no need to repeat it here. This feature was introduced in C Sharp language version 9, so you might want to make sure that you are using the correct version. Note that I'm applying this to the entire project. Going back to textures import function, we need to write a content tools function that returns an array of slices and an icon. For now, let's just pretend that we got these after calling this function. When the slices array is returned by the real content tools function, it should contain at least one slice. If that's the case, we assign the array to the slices property.
And then we are pretty much done, except you'd like to create an icon for the asset file, and also check if the texture has a size in pixels that's suitable for use on GPU. I'll come back to this in a bit, but first let's finish this function. So this function's name implies that the texture can have invalid dimensions. However, this is not entirely true. Some of the conditions aren't actually a problem if they are not met. The first condition is important when we are using block compression. As I explained in this video, block compression works on blocks of 4x4 pixels. Therefore, it's important for the size of the texture to be a multiple of 4 pixels. Although it's possible to encode textures with a size that isn't a multiple of 4, some older graphics APIs and graphics cards can't really work with it. Even in Direct3D 12, you'd have to query for an optional feature in order to check if the system supports non-multiple of 4 BC textures. That's why we would want to at least warn the user about this. The next condition is for the width and height not being equal, which is actually not a problem at all, but we still warn the user in case the width and height are so close that the texture looks square but isn't. Some earlier graphics cards could only work with textures with a size in pixels that is a power of 2. Modern graphics cards don't have this limitation, as far as I know, but they would still be able to do better optimizations in laying out the texture in memory so that it can be read more quickly, if the textures width and height are powers of 2. I see that we need to add a function in order to determine if a number is a power of 2. As you can see, we already wrote assertions that determine if a number is a power of 2, so I only have to repeat this here. And that's it for the validation function. The next bit is about creating an icon. For this I'm going to add another helper class for bitmap image operations. Oh wait, I see something unrelated that can be improved and I very much feel the urge to do it now. I'm not in the habit of suppressing my urges, because that's unhealthy. So let's create static arrays for file extensions and use those in the switch statement. The reason is that it makes it possible to reuse these arrays elsewhere if needed, instead of repeating the switch cases. Now we can use a pattern matching switch to determine if the file extension appears in any of these arrays.
We also return the asset when it's imported. Let me rewrite this import function so that it's easier to determine if it succeeded or not and handle each case accordingly. Here I add a scope that's going to be executed regardless of whether there was an exception or not. It will contain feedback to be displayed on the UI. Okay, back to our initial intent of writing a helper class for bitmap image generation. First I'll write a method for creating a thumbnail from a bitmap source. We already have the code for this in the geometry class. Remember that when we save a geometry asset, we do create a thumbnail for it. I'm just going to write it in a more generic way so it can be used for creating a thumbnail sized image. First we calculate by how much we need to scale the original image so that it can fit in a thumbnail. After scaling it using transformed bitmap, we can create a PNG image from it. We write this PNG image into a buffer and return it as an array of bytes. You can see we did something similar here when we generate an icon for the imported geometry. Now we can replace most of this code by a simple function call. Yes, much better. For texture assets, we are going to use the first image in the first mipmap for the icon, so we need to resize it and create a PNG image. To do this, we are going to add a function that takes a slice and returns a bitmap source. The additional is normal map parameters needed in order to distinguish between two-channel grayscale images and two-channel images that are used as normal map. In the latter case, we need to calculate the Z component and return an RGB image. I'll make this an optional parameter. Next, we calculate how many bytes per pixel are used for this image. Note that different formats use different number of bytes per pixel. The stride is just the width of the image multiplied by bytes per pixel. This is also known as the row pitch and is the same as the number of bytes that make up one row of pixels in the image. In order to create a bitmap source, we need to provide a pixel format that corresponds to how many color channels and how many bits per channel are used. As we'll see in a later episode, when we import an HDR image and pass it to the editor, it will have an RGBA format with 32 bits per channel. 
This makes for a total of 128 bits or 16 bytes per pixel. For RGBA images with 8 bits per channel, we'd like to use a 32-bit RGBA format. Oddly enough though, pixel formats doesn't have an enumeration for this format. So unless I'm missing something, we need to swap red and blue channels and use BGRA. It does have a 24-bit RGB enumeration, but since we are swapping channels anyway, we can keep using BGR format. Remember that this is only for display in the editor and has got nothing to do with the final texture asset itself. We'll still use BGR24 for two-channel images, because they are either a normal map, for which we need to calculate the Z component, or just a two-channel grayscale image. In that case, the blue channel is unused. For single-channel grayscale, we use 8-bit gray format. Now we need to copy the data according to pixel size. We can use block copy for this. For RGBA and RGB images, we swap the red and blue channels. This is only needed in order to display the images in WPF. For grayscale images with two channels, we first allocate a buffer to hold three channels. Don't forget to recalculate the stride for 24-bit pixels instead of 16. If the image is a normal map, then the blue channel is the Z component of the normal vector, which we calculate from the X and Y components. We copy the red and green channels. The blue channel is only used for normal maps and is zero otherwise. Later I might split this for loop to avoid calculating vector components when the image is not a normal map. Finally, for single channel grayscale images, we again just copy the pixel data. Then we create a bitmap source from BGR data using the image format, stride and image size. The resulting image is then returned. I think this is all we need to write for the import function. In the next video, we are going to write the import function for Content Tools API. That's where we'll call the C++ code that does the actual importing. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!